Deborah. Leave that church. We'll go home right now, right? <laughs> Deborah. Someone speaking to me? Yeah. I did that. Okay. What do you think now? Yep, that's it. <laughs> this was classical. <laughs> um, I want you to look at your bulletin for a moment. The part where it says, Divine Worship, 11 o'clock to 12.30 p.m. So I'd like everybody to stand up. Please stand up. Because I've heard that the, um, the mind can only absorb what the seat can endure. <laughs> So just reach up and say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right? And if you've stood up long enough, you may be seated. You know, all of us ADHD people, we get to wander around, we go to the piano, we go to the organ, we go back and forth, we go on the platform and all that stuff, and all the other people, they, you have to sit for a really long time. So we praise the Lord for that. Um, there was a preacher whose congregation decided to put a plaque on his uh, pulpit. And the plaque said, um, it's not on the, not the next screen, but the plaque said, feed the sheep, don't beat the goats. <laughs> so today I'm going to feed the sheep and not beat the goats. And if any goats are in here, you just remember we all got a little goat nature that we're fighting all the time, amen? amen. Today's message is about... Um, the message is, in Christ, planned, realized, experienced. I don't think we need that out, do we? I'd like to have it. Okay, our technician says we need it out. I want to read something from the Review of Herald that um, I thought was important. It says, the science of overcoming as Christ overcame is the science of salvation. Hmm. Overcoming as, there's a little echo. Overcoming as Christ overcame is the science of salvation. If we will unite with Christ in the work of developing Christian character, if we will maintain unwavering faith in God and in the truths of His Word, we shall be given strength to overcome every evil thing, every evil thing in the life. But, there are some to whom Christ says today, you will not come to me that you might have life, eternal life which my Father will give to all who believe. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He, he what? Please. He pleads. He pleads. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for our, our prayer? Our Father in heaven, You've sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, but not only that, to show us through his virgin birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, not only how much you care for us, but what we can have because you've sent your Son to do all this for us. Again, Lord, we ask you to open our eyes, our ears, our heart, our minds. We ask you to bind up Satan, the enemy against our soul, that he would not take away any of the seed that's going to be planted today, but it will grow up and bring forth much fruit. Amen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There's a key phrase that runs throughout um, Paul's epistles some 64 times, and uh, this recurring phrase, the central theme of Paul's theology, is in the expression, in Christ or in Christ Jesus. And this phrase is sometimes expressed by other synonymous phrases, such as in Him, by Him, through Him, in the Beloved, together with Him. And if these phrases were removed from Paul's writing, there would be very little left of Paul's um, ex exposition of the good news of the Gospel. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. Are, you, are you found in Christ today? Amen. All right, well, we're going to find out something that's even bigger than what we've thought about who is in Christ, because we want to realize that um, there is nothing that we have as Christians 
except it is in Christ. Amen. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. But he who has the Son has eternal life. And that's a deep thing that we, as we think about it, we're, we're going to explore it a little bit more. You know, our Lord has been our, um, our uh, creator of the universe, Colossians. He's our redeemer on the cross. He is our um, high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, making the intercession for us. Amen. He's in the holy of holies, judging us and purifying us as in the day of atonement. And soon he will come on the clouds of glory. He will have robes of vengeance, and then he will come as our king to rule forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Today we're going to talk about this part about being in Christ. Like we said, <coughs> we have, as Christians, we have nothing except what we have in Christ. So, if you're talking about the immediate and continuing joys of justification by faith, or uh, the ongoing experience of sanctification, and the hope of glorification are ours only as we are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7 will point that out to you. And outside of Him, we have nothing but sin, condemnation, and death. You agree? Yes. Outside of Christ, we have nothing but sin, condemnation, and death. And so, um, three stages of being of Christ's work for us. In fact, I think I'm going to go back one here. Um, there's something really important we have to realize because we're Americans. We are individualists. We think it's all about me most of the time. And if I could have those fans, that would be good, or something. Because we're okay. You know, you only get what you can ask for. <laughs> but if you think about it, we're Americans, we're individualists, we think about what is about me. But when God created Adam, he created every person that is ever going to be. Remember when it said that, uh, that um, paid, somebody paid tithes in the loins of Jacob? Yeah, Now, because of that? Levi. 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 Thank you very much. I, I wasn't going to use that scripture, so it's like out of my place to find it. But every person that's ever existed has was in the start of Adam. And the DNA that God gave Adam and Eve, notice he took Eve from Adam so that they share the same DNA. That's amazing. You know, that's what that is about. They, they're not separate from each other. And so this thing about Adam is he is all mankind. There's nobody who wasn't ever related to Adam. Amen. All the way back, and they were saved at the flood, so the flood people were related to Adam, and then they repopulated the earth. So all of us are part of Adam. And as far as God's concerned, when he looked at all the people, he saw children of who? Adam. Children of who? <laughs> who did God see children of? Who did he make? He only made one, Adam and Eve. So when he looks at people, who does he see? Adam. Adam, oh, Adam and Eve, but they're together. The word Adam means mankind, all of mankind. Okay? Yes. Okay, so maybe we're having a little feminine thing going on. I wasn't sure why I wasn't getting a response. But I do know this, that as God has done this, the amazing part of it is because he did it, he created man that way, he could send Jesus to take on that humanity and really rewrite the history that Adam and Eve created for us. Because when they decided to vote against God's plan and to vote for Satan's plan, they had, they lost their innocence. They realized they were naked. They were no longer clothed with God's presence. They were in their own presence. And they had sold out the planet to the arch enemy of God. They had sublet their kingdom to the enemy. And so now you think about it, God comes along and God rewrote the history of mankind through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Because when he came and sent Jesus, when Jesus went voluntarily to the cross to die, he took all of humanity with him. 
And he changed the legal status of Adam from condemnation, sin, and death to what? Justification yes. unto life. Amen? Amen. So this is interesting that God could do this from one man and, and just take another wonderful man. Now Jesus, he had what I used to say to people, he was 100% God, he was 100% man. Well, that's supposed to add up to 200%, right? But we don't talk about 200%. God's only begotten son came with his, de in his, his divine nature, <laughs> took on human sinful nature. But guess what? He conquered that human sinful nature. He did not allow it to control him. He did not yield to the thought processes of the law of sin and death that Adam had brought into human nature. Continually, he battled, fought, and won, and conquered sinful nature so that when it was time for him to die, there was no sin found in him. So he couldn't be taken under this condemnation, the law of sin and death, because he had conquered sin, and so he was not, so, he did not have to die for sin of his own. But he died for the sin, and this is, this gets tricky because it's very difficult to even talk about these things without saying something that sounds confusing. But Jesus, we say Jesus paid it all. Jesus did this for us and achieved this victory in that when he went to the cross, he took all of humanity and paid that debt, not for himself, but for who? Us. For us. Now, I'd like to get that straightened out. The, like the first Adam, Christ also represented and substituted the entire human race in his work of redemption. Do we all agree? So now, how does this work? Because I've been in other churches, you've been in other churches, maybe not as much as some of us, but you hear different ways that people talk about how people are saved. And some of these things are, are confusing because, because they, do, they, they don't explain all the, all the scriptures altogether. Let's put it that way. I have been in uh, certain churches where they say once you're saved, you're always saved. And you can do nothing about it. And then they take it a step farther and they say God knows who's going to be saved and God knows who's not going to be saved. And do you realize, I was reading in, in Michener's book about South Africa, that when the first uh, European missionaries went there, they were Dutch Reform, they were Calvinistic in their theology, and they were not sure whether they should preach to the indigenous people that they found in South Africa because they were not sure whether Jesus had died for those people. So, since God has an elect and God has a non-elect, is it worth our trouble to present the gospel to folks that are not part of the elect? And are these people that are different than we've ever known or seen or cultured with before, are they really worth our effort? Are we, are we supposed to preach the gospel to them? Absolutely. Well, your answer is absolutely. But for them, it was a conundrum. They did not know whether they should or shouldn't because they had not taken this picture of Christ taking all of humanity to the cross. Amen. We are one blood. Amen. So, this first stage may be one of the reasons why people got into this overreaction to predestination, if I could say it like that. Because there was, there is a planning stage, and I'm going to talk about three stages, and I'm going to do this quickly, so study on your own more. But there's a planning stage in the eternity path that really supports the concept of predestination. Because these things are talked about as if they're, as if they're done and accomplished. And um, we're going to look at some of those scriptures in just a moment. The other thing is there is a reality stage through, and this should actually say Jesus' birth, 
life, death, and resurrection. Because if we don't study his birth, we don't realize the amazing source of, of how he came to existence on this planet. Amen. So it should say reality stage through Jesus' birth, life, death, and re resurrection. That's a reality. You can't do anything about that. That's a done fact. Amen? Amen. 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 And then the experience stage, receiving this gift. Now this is the part that some folks actually have a fear because they want the first two parts to be so real to them that they, they don't want to talk about the third part because it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about this a little bit. And in the planning stage in eternity past, how do I know that that's true, that God had a plan in eternity past? And the reason I know it's true, whoops, this is Deborah again, hang on, um, is because, which one's the... Laser, I should know that. One right in the middle. Oh, one in the middle. Is because all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the land slain from the foundation of the world. So before, the, what's the foundation of the world? God had already made a plan that there would be a lamb who would be slain so that people could be saved in eternity past. That's Revelation 13, verse 8. Another scripture that supports this is from Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. This says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, where's that word again, in Christ, just as He chose us in Him. When did He choose us? Before the foundation, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And so if you took this as meaning he's only chosen some people, I guess you could get the concept of, uh, of election. Now, let's go back to that. Um, the concept of election is true. It's taught in the Bible. But who did God want to save? Everyone. Everyone? God wanted to save everyone. God wanted to. God's plan was for Adam and Eve to procreate and to populate the world and that they would all stay in the family of God forever, right? But he knew in giving them uh, self-choice and the freedom to have um, choice is, going, is the only thing that makes us be able to love people, right? Because if without choice, you really, you can't force them to be loving. So God had to give you choice. Then he knew that just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. So he made a provision way back in eternity past that the Lamb of God would be would, would sacrificed, and he called the Lamb, that's the obvious that was sacrificed, before the foundation of the world. Now if we looked at just those scriptures, we might think that we can see predestination. But when we remember that God took all of humanity in Adam, we see that that predestination is for everyone. everyone. Everyone that's related to Adam, and everyone is related to Adam. So then we're brought to another stage, the second stage. And that second stage is um, at the stage that uh, I borrowed from a writer, um, actually. I put him up there to begin with. But the second stage is reality stage or objective stage. And in this stage, you see that the thing that Jesus had to do while he was on the planet, he did. Did he? Amen? Yes. It's just really warm in here. You can watch the people fading. Um, we're, we need either fan or AC. AC's on. Well, there's temperature readings on AC. Um, thank you, Will. Because I know it's colder on this side than that side. By the way, I have a question. We are not taking questions right now. No, you're not? No, okay. maybe I'll take them at the end. Okay. Okay, after the benediction, if you don't mind. Reality stage or objective stage, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 30 through 31. But God has brought you into union with Christ Jesus, and God has made Christ to be our wisdom. Now, what, ver what tense is this? By him we are put right with God. We become God's holy people and are set free. So then, as the scripture says, whoever wants to boast must boast of what? This last verse. The Lord has done. So God has done something through Christ Jesus, and it's accomplished. Again, 
Uh, you can't do anything about it because it's been done. And what is it that the Lord has done? He's put you right with God. We have become God's holy people and we are set free. Brought you into union with Christ Jesus is the, is the, is the biggest thing that we're looking at there. Look at this part. Um, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Do you know that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous? So even the unrighteous are going to be made alive again one day at the end of the, uh, at the end of the thousand years. So Christ has done something for the, for every living person. He made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now Jesus paid it all. Now, but the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. The believing part does not change the fact that Jesus, because he conquered sin and death, has this gift been given to all humanity. Now, one of the things about that, and I, I want to I want to talk about that for just a second, um, but I think I'll talk about it at at the end of the third phase after we've understood the third phase. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of, of glory of God, but being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, how many people are in Christ Jesus then? All the all the when, who did, who did Jesus take to the cross? All the all of humanity, because he represented humanity, just like Adam represented humanity, Jesus represented humanity. So there is, by his grace, there is redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Now, this part is the, is the part that we have to, to deal with, however. There's an experience phase. Because of free will, can we reject or we can't deny what Christ has done, but some by their actions pretend like it's not applying to them, but they don't, God has already done for his children that are in Adam this thing that he's done through Jesus Christ. So, it is a gift. It's done. He has given us this gift. Because if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, who was that one man that brought death? Adam. Everybody? Adam. Adam. But much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through which other one? Jesus. Jesus Christ. This has been a gift. Now because it's a gift, like any gift, you can, it has to be received by faith in order for it to become effective. The gift has to be done, received by faith in order for it to become effective in the life of the believer. Now the first two phases are really for everyone, but the third phase, the experience phase, is for the believer. The planning was for everyone. The objective reality that Jesus died and took everyone to the cross is for everyone. But the third part is that part where I, you personally continue to recognize what Jesus has done for us. We experience that through faith. And as we experience that through faith, that, that experience phase will continue in this life until the second coming of Christ when this corruption puts on incorruption. Because guess what? There in uh, Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 2, it talks about the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. There is a continuous, and we could study what that sin, sin has a, is a force of its own. We wrestle with the force of that, of sin that what resides in our human nature. And, and this morning in Sabbath school class, it was mentioned that, you know, the human nature wants to sin. You know? But thank God we have been given the chance to be new creatures in Christ. Amen. And we, like Christ, overcame the science of salvation. How did Christ overcame? He did not yield his mind, his spirit, his body to 
the, the desires of the flesh. He walked in the spirit and he overcame by walking in the spirit. So, but those who by faith have believed in Jesus Christ and experienced this new birth, they're the ones who have entered into this experience of phase three. Now, let's not get so excited about denying phase one and two that we, we um, deny phase three. That it does require us to, it requires us to believe what Jesus has done for us. But here's the difference. If you were a Calvinist, you would believe that, let me, let me go through here, let's read the scripture. Even Gentiles, okay, this is important. But if you were a Calvinist, you might believe that only certain people are saved and God only really died and made provision for the salvation of certain people. That's called, that's a provisional salvation. On the other hand, you might be a person who um, believes that, and traditionally, I, I know this is where I was when I started this study, you might be a person who um, believe that, um, one um, must repent and believe in Jesus Christ, we do believe that, but only then will God place a person into Christ. You see the difference? That now it depends on you, all these lost people out here, unless they, unless they begin the process, they can't get into Christ. So that's like denying our heritage because if through one man everybody fell, then through one man, the Bible says that he brought everybody back into a relationship with God. So it's more like this, that I go up to you and I tell you, you're in a prison door, but guess what? It's unlocked. All you got to do is come out. Jesus has already done everything necessary for you to inherit eternal life. And, and the, the funny part about it uh, is this thing. I thought this was interesting to read. <coughs> Faith is not allowing God or giving him permission to put us into Christ You hear that? Faith is not allowing God or giving Him permission to put us into Christ, but with grateful hearts, accepting what God has already accomplished for mankind in Christ. Do you see the difference? Do you feel the difference? Are you wandering around, you know, just... And there are a lot of people who have heard a different gospel, and they're just thinking... Well, maybe if I do this, God will accept me. And the difference is, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, he has already made provision of acceptance of a whole human race, correct? We are not using our faith to get to God. We are using our faith to believe what God has already done. Amen. Why did Jesus say, it is finished at the cross? And there is more to come because it, this is a deep this is a deep thought I think. Now, interestingly enough, for me this was really important, and I've only got a little time to share it with you. So, everybody, wake up. Romans two fourteen through sixteen. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know His law when they instinctively what? Obey. Are those actions or what? instinctively obey it. Would you be able to tell or see or notice if somebody was instinctively obeying God's law? Is it possible that there's a heathen somewhere who knows that it's wrong to steal his neighbor's wife, knows that it's wrong to uh, lie, knows that it's wrong to murder? Is there a heathen somewhere that instinctively, when they show his law, when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it, is it possible that God, who this person who is, you know, uneducated and, 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 and doesn't have a Bible and can't read and has never seen a missionary somewhere, is the person in their village who senses and is moved by the Holy Spirit to have something happen to them? Well, I'll tell you, if it's provisional or, or you know, uh, li that limited atonement where God's only picked certain people, 
and they never confess Christ, guess what? There's no hope for them. If that's the way it happens. If it's the point where you have to be the initiator and you have to give God permission to put you in Christ, that heathen has no, no hope either. Because he doesn't know to do all that. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. I think I have another scripture on that. 